Hello, hello. Happy Friday, everybody. Uh, welcome to a slightly earlier version of uh, Virtual Morning Report. Uh, Prof Rez is on his way. He's actually uh, walking to work, so will be with us momentarily. Uh, we're very, very excited because it's uh, Mariana's first case presentation today. Uh, thank you so much for uh, preparing it, Mariana. And I want to hand you the mic in a second, but I actually see somebody uh, in the audience who was one of the like OG members of VMR who hasn't been on VMR, at least uh, when I've been around in a long, long time. Her name is Han. She is a um, medical doctor in Vietnam. And I just wanted to say, hi, Han. It's so, so, so nice to see you. Um, I vividly remember all your cases from Vietnam, including y'all. She presented a really, really interesting case of a, of two interesting cases, a patient who had a telomerase uh, issue uh, and presented with bone marrow failure and uh, fibrosis and skin changes. And then she bamboozles us again by presenting a case very unique to Vietnam of strep suis meningitis, which is a pig-borne uh, disease. And a reminder for me that not all strep infections come from your skin, that they can come from other organisms. So I learned so much from you, Han, and it's really nice to see you here. Um, see you here again. Mariana, how are you feeling? Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm a little bit nervous, but I, I think it will work out in the end. So let's see. I think you'll do fantastic. Um, our case presenter from yesterday, Francisco, is here too. Francisco, do you have any tips or pointers from your experience? Hi there. Uh, so yeah, just just be relaxed, let it flow. The 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 people that discuss the case do a fantastic job, and yeah, enjoy, enjoy. That's so so kind. <laughs> Thank you, Francisco. Prof Rez just texted me that he's a couple minutes away, so um, I'm inclined to uh, to wait for him. And as you know. Whenever we're doing that, I try to. Uh, I'll try to uh, to meet somebody that I haven't met before, and um, it's easier to ask people who have their videos on. So I see Elena here. Hi, Elena. Do you mind unmuting and tell us telling us about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I am a medical student from Berlin, and awesome. I've been following you for a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I'm enjoying it a lot. I've uh, participated in some student VMRs. And yeah, it's great. <laughs> Welcome, Lynn. It's so nice to meet you. Um, how far along in your training are you? I'm in my fifth year. Fifth year, okay. Um, do you know Shema or have heard of Shema, or what's your uh, what's your overlap with her? Any? I know that we we're at the same university, but yeah. I didn't I didn't like get to know um, the, uh, CPS Silvas. I like it through her. I see. I see. That's so interesting. Look at that. That's really cool. And what do you like to do outside of medicine, Elena? What do you enjoy? I uh, I like doing sports <laughs> a lot. Oh yeah. And yeah, you know, just like hanging out with friends, being outside. Amazing. That's so so cool. You know, somebody else who's part uh, has orbits with Germany is Nicola. Hi, Nicola. <laughs> Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good as well. <laughs> I still remember your incredible case on the Germany team VMR. I'm not sure if Elena has listened to that one. It was really, really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was such an amazing experience. So yeah, I'm going to carry that case uh, for a long time, I think, I'm sure. I'm so, so, so glad that uh, that you uh, presented it and you're spending your, your day with us here. I also wanted to say hi to uh, Renato. Hi, Renato. Where are you calling from, buddy? From Peru. Oh, from Peru! Amazing, yeah. so cool. It's nice to see you. I, I, uh, I noticed that you turn your video on quite frequently, and it makes it such a different experience. So, thank you so much for showing us your face and uh, um, entrenching with us in VMR. It's a real treat. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the welcome. It really okay. does make it a different experience. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And somebody else's video just popped up. Hello. What's up, Prof Rez? Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Hello from everyone. Bobby, what are you wearing? What is that? What jersey? It's Man U. Um, well, Kara got um, it. Kara got it for me uh, because um, she, I think she's like, listen, you can't just advertise clinical problem solvers all day, every day, because all my other running gear is uh, actually uh, gear that Prof Res bought for me that has a big DX logo here. Um, so I occasionally wear something else, and today just happened <laughs> happened to be that day. 
I'm going to go for a run right after this before work. <laughs> How are you, Prefrez? How was your walk? The walk was incredible. Got through the park, watched people playing soccer. Um, was not too envious of them because I'm happy to be at work, yeah. enjoying my time here. Soccer at 7 a.m., huh? So yeah, that's... every day, man. 7 wow. a.m. Sometimes I see serious people playing with like, you know, they're serious when they have like 20 soccer balls. Yeah. And they're just like passing it. Tiki talk football. Yeah, 100%. But then sometimes it's older people with a belly that are running around <laughs> and I want to join them. <laughs> I want to join them and then I want to dominate them. That's definitely where I belong. Although I will join them and then be dominated by you, probably. No, that's definitely not the truth. Oh, that's so I, I would love to kick the ball as hard as I can through your chest and make, <laughs> make up for that ping pong match in Iceland. <laughs> Y'all have to listen to RLR CP solvers to understand 90% of what we talk about. So there's, <laughs> there's, there's another hidden flaw. It's, it's a unique language at this point. <laughs> exactly. Prof Rez, uh, Mariana is presenting for the first time. Um, we're very, very excited uh, for your case, Mariana. And I think um, maybe you can introduce yourself to reintroduce yourself to the VMR crowd, and then we can jump right, right in. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Mariana. I'm a Brazilian medical uh, graduate now. Uh, I've been joining the VMR sections for uh, two months now, and I'm really, really happy to be here presenting my first case. Um, this is a note case because since I graduated, I haven't seen a lot of patients. It's so bad, but I hope you enjoy it. It's a special case and I'll be um, waiting for feedback. Awesome. Right. Yes, please take it away. Okay, so uh, our patient today is a 59-year-old man with progressive chest pain in the last 10 days. Prof Raz, go for it, buddy. Awesome. Well, very excited, uh, Mariana, that you're presenting for the first time. This will be a joy. And I'll be very brief here because we're going to need much more information. For example, we don't have the past medical history or the risk factors of the patient. And if I were in the emergency department evaluating this patient, I would immediately want EKG, troponin, and chest x-ray and it is true that the duration of symptoms lessen the likelihood of a hyperacute vascular phenomenon, i.e., or e.g., examples include aortic dissection, pulmonary embolus, and even uh, a rupture into the pleural cavity like pneumothorax. That duration lessens the likelihood, but it doesn't eliminate it. Robbie, recently at Morning Report, we had a case of a patient with just weeks of feeling fatigue and some heart failure symptoms, ended up having a type B aortic dissection that was going all the way up. And so all those are on the table, but we have to be honest here. We're a little less concerned just given the duration, but we will still evaluate with EKG, chest x-ray, and troponin. But of course, more information first, Mariana. Okay, so the patient reports that the pain started 10 days. Oh no, I think we lost her. Uh... And no... Mariana, I think I think for a second it, uh, we got um, we got the 10 days part, and then your. Uh, your video went out. Do you mind saying it again? Yes, yes, of course. So it's a patient that reports that the pain started 10 days ago. It's a progressive burning pain, which gets worse with exertion. He denies uh, nausea or vomit. There is no headache. The pain is not related to eating and there is no fever or dyspnea. Yeah, I think... Uh... Mariana, this is a very rich history and is very, very helpful. And I think at the end of the day, you said something that is very alarming, which is that exertion brings out the pain. And um, when you're thinking about chest pain and you're thinking about it 
uh, from a, a simplistic lens, you know that something from the um, from the skin all the way down to the spine is bothering the patient. And the question is, how do you make progress on um, uh, on localizing within that space? And the skin doesn't care about exertion. The spine doesn't care about exertion. It really is the cardiopulmonary apparatus that does. And so here, no matter what you say, the fact that it's influenced by exertion is very alarming and suggest a cardiopulmonary disease or a disorder of the blood that courses between those two organs. But I think there is a very intriguing aspect here, which is that it has taken the patient 10 days to arrive in the emergency room for this. And there are fundamentally two, two possibilities. Either the patient has a neuropsychosocial difference that separates him from the vast majority of the population who would have chosen to come to the emergency room at an earlier point for a condition like this. Or this is actually a subtle clue as to the pathophysiological nature of this cardiopulmonary disorder in that it takes on a less aggressive tempo than um, the diseases that Prof has mentioned. Or third, that this patient has a typical cause of sinister disease but is presenting in a more indolent manner. So I think I do take stock in the fact that this is taking 10 days for the patient to arrive. And we'll have to file that as a separate problem, a separate clue. Is it neuropsychosocial? Does he have schizophrenia and is presenting in a delayed manner? Um, does he have a less common cause with more indolent cardiopulmonary pathology? Or does he have a classic uh, presentation of ACS or aortic dissection? of which a fraction of patients do present in a delayed manner. So it'll be interesting to study that dimension, but the most helpful thing you just said here is it's influenced by exertion, which will um, uh, mandate even closer scrutiny of all the data we would get anyway. Uh, but all of a sudden one T wave inversion is gonna mean much more than it would have otherwise. Any other thoughts, Prof Rez? I, I love that schematic approach or that framework approach. Okay, so let's continue. Um, in the past medical history, he has a history of hypertension for which he has been taking captopril, propionolol, and amlodipine. Um, do you think I continue or I stop here? Can I go? Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, go for it. So, uh, his surgical history includes aortic valve replacement and Stanford Day aortic. Uh, dissection correction 13 years prior. Uh, there's no tobacco or alcohol use, no related family history, and no allergies. All right, maybe I can comment quickly on the past medical information. This is starting to get a little juicy with the background data. I think. Right away, you ask the question, why did someone have an aortic dissection? And when you're thinking of aortic dissection, we like to classify them as type A, which is at the point of the, the left subclavian artery, or type B, which is below the point of the subclavian artery. It's almost how we classify upper GI bleed as above the ligament of trites. And the reason we do that, it, it changes our approach to the management but I'm going to share something with you that I wasn't aware of prior to reading about this uh, the, a couple of weeks ago. That is, we often think type A is an acute surgical emergency. This is correct. This is correct. Type B, we think, oh, it's just medical management. But did you know that about 40 to 50% of type B aortic dissection, those patients die within five to six years? So, what the trend seems to be now is not acute vascular intervention for the type B, but more so consider it, you know, a few months later, a year later to have endovascular therapy. So in this case, I pause there because you have to ask the question, why does he have an ascending aortic dissection? For that question, I'm going to ask Robbie to, to discuss that DDX. But for myself, what I'm going to focus on is how does this information make us approach his chest pain. What this does for me is in addition to all the causes Robbie mentioned from 
angina to heart failure, you have to include some kind of abnormality with the valve. And that abnormality can come in the form of paravalvular leak. It can come in the form of a thrombosis. It can come in the form of just a malfunctioning valve. So now this is not just your typical patient with a healthy background coming in with 10 days of exertional chest pain. It must be incorporated into the frame. This is a middle-aged man, prior history of aortic dissection, status post-aortic valve replacement, who's now coming in with 10 days of exertional angina, because all of a sudden, it doesn't limit the DDX, but it broadens, and I have a much lower threshold to get an echocardiogram to evaluate the valve structure. I love that. Yeah, Prof. Rez, I think it's so interesting now that the first thing you might want to run to is an echo. It's crazy how that this case changes that. And I think if you're just trying to be systematic about evaluating aortic dissections, the first thing you'll ask is for data you already have for free, which is whether, what is the underlying health of the aorta? Because 20% of patients with an aortic dissection have a large or dilated aorta, an aortopathy, or rarely they have coarctation of the aorta. That information you have for free and you should use it to your advantage. So an aortic dissection on top of chronic aortic disease or aortic dissection without evidence of chronic aortic dilation or stenosis. Different, um, different landscapes. Um, but if you try to practice uh, analyzing that the aortic dissection without that data, it really comes down to one of three variables, inflammation, genetics, or idiopathic. And the idiopathic category is not truly idiopathic. It is a combination of age-related degenerative changes that are often accelerated by hypertension, which is a diagnosis of exclusion here and a diagnosis of exclusion in most patients because you can never prove that the patient's age or blood pressure alone caused aortic dissection, but the distance to that conclusion is reduced in patients who are older and who have long-standing hypertension. But everybody needs at least an initial analysis for inflammatory aortic diseases, which again, show up on the CT scan. You'll see evidence of inflammation. So Takayasu's with dissection or Salmonella aortitis with dissection. The most nebulous category tends to be uh, genetic diseases that cause uh, genetic connective tissue diseases. And you can filter those as either systemic diseases or aortic restricted diseases. And the most common systemic diseases are ehlers danlos Marfan's, and lois dietz um, with the latter being the rarest, but the most characteristic uh, on imaging. And it comes with aortic tortuosity and actually craniofacial abnormalities. So it's easy to filter that out, honestly, even though it's rare, it has such characteristic physical exam and imaging findings. So that's sort of connective tissue under systemic, but there are, it's more likely actually to have a local uh, uh, connective tissue disease of the aorta, um, either from uh, bicuspid aortopathy, which we'll talk about in a second, and then um, familial aortic dissection syndromes, where it's a non, uh, uh, a limited form of uh, connective tissue disease that just affects family members of the aorta. But we have another clue here. And the other clue is, well, this patient not only had an aortic dissection, but needed a valve replacement. And the valve replacement may simply be because the patient had extension of the aortic dissection into their uh, um, aortic valve, necessitating, necessitating that. But it might be the clue that this patient had a bicuspid uh, valve and developed aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation and subsequently had dissection. And so... Um, it doesn't change the calculus at all, really, because once you've had an aortic dissection once, you certainly can have it again. Um, but I think a general framework for it is idiopathic slash age hypertension, um, genetic, either systemic genetic diseases like Erlos Danlos or local genetic diseases like bicuspid aortopathy, um, and rarely uh, inflammatory aortic diseases, infectious or autoimmune. Um, and here, the aortic valve replacement nudges up bicuspid aortopathy, but also could just be the cause of any aortic dissection with subsequent aortic regurgitation. So really, really curious to see how this influences our thinking. Oh, you're muted, buddy. 
Oh, great discussion. Um, so I think, uh, Mariana, I think Prof Rez is uh, trying to find the mute button. I see him. So oh, I'm give sorry. him one second. No, 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 it's okay. okay. I just stare at him obsessively all day, every day. So I noticed. Uh oh. He's... Has Zoom's forever silenced you? The forever interjector <laughs> cannot be heard. Wait, did I just hear you? I can't tell. It's working now. Yeah, but it's a different mic. It's yeah, like... I have to retry the Yeti mic. But I was going to say, like, your recent case presentation in Japan of that young woman with recurrent abdominal pain, diarrhea, et cetera, at age 20, she presented to the hospital, but had a decade of symptoms. And that decade of symptoms meant the pathology or manifestation started 10 years ago. So we had to put the pathology at 10 years old, making Crohn's and Bichette's less likely and prioritizing haplo age. 20 uh, insufficiency. This is similar. Like you have someone, you can't say you had an aortic dissection at 59, which wouldn't be that odd with like cardiovascular risk factors. But he has a dissection less than age 50, which I think highlights the point you're making. Yeah, 100%. I had another plug for RLR CP solvers, by the way. I think we do it all sneakily all the time. Um, you, should, you should subscribe to catch Prof Rez's wisdom. All right, Mariana, tell us more. Okay, so about his vitals. He is febrile, uh, heart rate is 84 beats per minute, uh, respiratory rate 16, sat 98% in room there, and blood pressure is 114 uh, over 73. Physical examination. Um, general, no abnormalities, cardiovascular within normal limits, there uh, there's no murmurs, but there is a symmetric radial pulse and it's decreased on the left. Uh, respiratory is within normal limits, no crackles. There's a progressive pulsating bulge in his right hemithorax. And I have a picture to show you, uh, but I'll finish the, the description of the physical exam. Um, there is no abnormalities in the abdomen and no edema. So can I share my screen to show you the picture? Oh, so can you see my, my screen? Uh, so he, here is the bulge that we can uh, see in the right hemithorax, and, and it's really interesting to uh, to to see that in the left hemithorax it's like flat, and there is this bulge in the right hemithorax. Mariana, can I just ask one clarifying question? Um, is the bulge pulsatile or is it static? Can you feel it moving? Yes, it's pulsatile. Um, I'll honestly leave the exam for Prof. Rez to analyze because I think I'll just take the vital signs, which are so incredibly powerfully pertinently negative here. So I think when you're thinking about chest pain, really the things that you care to diagnose in the emergency room acutely are cardiac diseases, pulmonary diseases, and the things that connect them, i.e. mediastinal diseases. And cardiac diseases often show up on your vascular slash volume exam and on your EKG and troponin. Pulmonary diseases almost always show up on your imaging. But mediastinal diseases are notoriously difficult to diagnose in large part because they don't affect your vitals as early and as quickly as hypoxemia would show up in the lungs or hypercarbia or tachycardia and hypotension would show up with cardiac diseases. The bridge between the lungs and the heart is a zone of serious danger with overt declaration in the vital signs in a much more delayed fashion than, um, than primary cardiac or primary lung diseases. 
in large part because cardiac diseases will affect the hemodynamics much quicker than a mediastinal disease will. And if a mediastinal disease like a pulmonary embolism or an aortic dissection is affecting your vital signs, by the time it is, it usually is life-threatening on the order of hours or even minutes. So if you have a patient with a massive pulmonary embolism, which is only a fraction of PE, or a patient with aortic dissection, which is such a rare cause of, of chest pain, most of those patients will have normal vital signs, completely normal vital signs. And when they are tachycardic, hypotensive, hypertensive, it's usually really serious and really obvious. So this patient has a bulge from this disease process, and yet his vital signs are completely normal, which goes to show you that the reason that media that um, aortic dissection and pulmonary embolism are one of the most common causes of misdiagnosis in the world is because they can be so subtle until they essentially lead the patient to peri death. And that's absolutely terrifying and very humbling and why we all need to practice and think about them all the time. Um, but I'll pass the mic to Prof. Rez for the other maybe pertinent positive findings. <laughs> I, I think, um, first of all, what a striking image, Mariana, really, really striking. And what sort of shocks me though, I've seen this over and over again, is that patients have an abnormality that develops and at some point, that abnormality or the symptoms from it crosses a threshold for them to come to medical attention. I'd be very curious, like over what time frame that pulsatile bulge developed and what might have prevented him from coming to the hospital sooner. For example, I don't think that happened overnight. And when um, I view that and when you mention it's pulsatile, all of a sudden the frame shifts from a 59-year-old with 10 days of chest pain, 59-year-old with history of aortic dissection, aortic valve replacement, who's presenting with 10 days of exertional chest pain, an exam showing a pulsatile bulge over in the right pectoralis region. So this is a vascular abnormality until proven otherwise. And then the question becomes, is this related to his prior surgery or as a complication of that, or is it completely unrelated? And it's just another manifestation of his underlying vasculopathy that led to the initial aortic dissection. And so the next steps is going to be a CT scan with contrast, and you're going to evaluate what this appears like. And if I'm applying this, so why is he having exertional chest pain? Just given the proximity to the heart, I wonder if there's some kind of still phenomenon that's leading to angina, or if there's some kind of mass effect with movement or change in body posture. I like the idea of the still phenomenon more than mass effect, just because if, if he's standing, gravity is pulling that liquid down, um, I don't expect that walking should worsen the size of that pulsatile mass. Because there are, for example, intracranial tumors that in the morning, you feel the headache worse, you feel the nausea worse. Because when you lie supine and you take away the effect of gravity, you have increased flow to the sides and you get mass effect of the tumor. So to answer my two questions, I don't think this is a complication of this surgery. I think this is a strong signal to underlying vascular disease um, in this individual that, again, if you go back, he had the dissection at age 47, 48, which is quite young without many um, risk factors. So then we go into the, the comments that Robbie made from Marfans to Louis Ditz to all those Ehlers Danlos and anything that can potentially involve what seems to be a large vessel. So next steps, echocardiogram. And before that, a CT with contrast to evaluate uh, for some kind of vascular abnormality, whether it's an aneurysm, a fistula, or something. And in this patient, I would just do the whole body. Honestly, I wouldn't just do the chest. I'll do the chest. Adam, I want to see his entire vascular system to see if there's lesions anywhere else. Robbie, anything to add to that? 
Superb, my friend. I actually, I think you're right. I did not anticipate the need for abdominal imaging, but I think depending on where you are in the world, I mean, if you have limited limited resources, your CT chest is definitely the money shot. But yeah, I think, gosh, if so much badness is happening in his chest, what are the probability it's not happening in his belly? Is a really good thought. Love it. Wayana, tell us more, please. What a what a rich case you have. I'm so glad you saved the picture from uh, from your uh, earlier days. It's a very helpful. Thank you. So um, about his lips, uh, the white blood count was 700, uh, platelets 300,000, and hemoglobin was 12. Um, sodium was 140, potassium 4.5, creatinine 0 0.9, BUN 30, and troponin within normal limits. It was like uh, negative. And can I continue with um, EKG? Oh, Mary, maybe just one clarification. Is the white count low or is it normal? In it's your normal. Okay. It's, uh -huh. it, it's, Maybe 7,000 then? Yeah, yes. Yes, I'm sorry, 7,000. No, no, that's okay. I was like, oh, this is getting really interesting. A hematological issue on the aorta or, yeah, but nope. <laughs> oh yeah, please go ahead. So the EKG um, was normal, uh, regular rhythm, no ischemic signs. Uh, X-ray, there was a... Um, consolidation in the right median lobe with mediastinal enlargement. And um, the EET, the, the ultrasound was not performed. And we have now um, a, a CT chest that I can share with you. Um, so I have the images and I have the video. I think the video would be better for the first time. Um, so can you see my screen? Okay. So I'm not very good describing images. So if you want to uh, point out something here, but I think what the most important thing here is that we can see the boat here that is literally blood because it's connecting with the aorta here. So this is what we call the aortocutaneous fistula. And here we also can see that aorta is like totally damaged. Do you want to say something else here? A yeah, very striking image. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So continuing here, this is the first. Uh, it's called the first surgery that he he uh that was performed. It was a Castro Bernardis surgery, and there is a replacement uh, of the aortic valve, and this is the the previous ring like totally damaged here, probably because of mechanical forces. And continuing. So here we also have like the chest, uh, the arctic, totally damaged because of the mechanical forces as well. And this is the video, and I also have images here, but I think the video is, is so much better to visualize. Oh my gosh, this is just so, um, yeah, this is so um, powerful, uh, Mariana. I think, um, uh, yeah, I think that, um, there are many, there are some open ends, but I think now you're saying that the bulge is blood. And the question is, where is the blood coming from? And I think you can see that the aorta is contiguous with that. 
which is concerning for um, ongoing ooze from the aorta. And I think uh, it's not shocking in general, though it does, it's not, it was not on my known list of aortic complications in terms of an aortocutaneous fistula. Um, but I have heard of uh, aortopulmonary fistulas and aortobronchial fistulas. And it reminds me very much of uh, Moataz's case of an SVC to bronchial fistula, and just the very notion that um, that uh, these vessels can connect with adjacent tissue is something that I think is um, uh, um, that I have grasp of, though I never have heard of or imagined a fistula to the skin, which is crazy to imagine if the skin finally erodes that this patient would essentially exsanguinate externally from his aorta, which is crazy to think about. Um, as a general rule of thumb, whenever you're thinking about aortic diseases, we worry a lot about internal complications like dissection, aneurysm formation, and um, thromboembolism. But there are two external manifestations of uh, chronic aortic diseases, one of which is compression. So the aortic aneurysm can compress on things like this, the esophagus causing dysphagia or the lungs causing chronic cough and recurrent infections. So compression is a big one. And then the other big one uh, is fistulization. And I will add to my list of fistulization now an aortocutaneous fistula. I've never heard of it um, or seen it. I'm very, very riveting. Um, I can't, I'm, I'm so curious to learn what the management was for this patient, how you thought this through. And I think one open diagnostic question for Prof. Rez and I is, why is something so devastating and so severe happening to this young man? And um, yeah, I'm curious, Prof. Rez, what your reflections are on the, on the image and, and the underlying question to try to mitigate this going forward. I, I think that's such an important question to ask. And my sort of reflection on this case is not that you have to know all of these abnormalities. This is what you need to know. A patient who has a history of dissection and valve replacement, when they present with chest pain, they need imaging. They need potentially an echocardiogram because, um, yeah, it's that background is so rich and so influential. It can't be ignored. And it has to broaden your DDX to common etiologies of chest pain. As, for, as far as the cause, Robbie, I think you have to go back and just look at your diagnostic checklist for anything that can cause um, vessel abnormality, like the examples you listed with Ehlers Danlos, with Marfans. Remember, you had a patient with Kleinfelters that got diagnosed at the age of 30. I've, I, I had a patient with myotonic dystrophy that got diagnosed at the age of 40. So it's all about stepping back. You don't need to memorize that list. But what you need to do is ask the question, the question that Robbie asked, why is a young person presenting with such fragile arterial vessel disease? And that should lead to a DDX. And then you compare and contrast between the patient's presentation and the illness script. And then this is a person I would send, you know, additional tests in and um, would involve consultants to not only fix the problem, of course, but to ask that very beautiful question of why is it happening? So, yeah, this case, this case didn't end up really well because it happened during the pandemics and like all our uh, surgeries were, uh, was, it uh, our surgeries were delayed at that point. So the patient was hospitalized under ICU with control and hypertension, um, like with control, uh, pain, pain and hypertension control, I'm sorry. And, and then we were waiting for our surgical team to perform the surgery, but the patient appeared with COVID-19 symptoms. And he passed away, not because of the arteriogenous fistula, but because of kidney and uh, lung failure. It is a really, really bad case. 
And uh, just to answer some uh, questions, um, he he lost his follow up after the first surgery, so we couldn't we couldn't like diagnose uh, under underlying causes of his hypertension and and the cause of his first uh, aortic dissection. And also, he he reported that he was uh, like used to feel chest pain, and that is the reason why he took so long to um, to go to the hospital for the first time because the chest pain started to be progressive and like it used to to uh, to to come and go, and this time it it, it didn't go out. So uh, that that was the reason why he he decided to look for medical assistance in this in this time and it was a, like a huge disease. Yeah, Mariana, there's so much to reflect on this case. And I think for me, going back to answering the very burning question of who shows up to the emergency room with 10 days of chest pain. And I think it's such a humbling reminder that humbling reminder that patients with chronic disease um, can have their uh, presentation habits unaffected by their chronic disease for sure. But I think more common in my experience is that patients with chronic disease have their presentations pattern altered. What I mean by that is patients can either develop such fear and anxiety as a result of their prior chronic disease that they present so early and often with um, nonspecific findings. Patients with prior MI I have so many of them come in, oh, my chest twitches or twingle, or I just heard one thing, or I just didn't feel right. And they're worried it's an MI. And that happens a lot. But equally likely is patients are so uh, accustomed to their chronic disease that there's a delay in their presentation. And I think it really is an effect of the neuropsychosocial consequences of, of a chronic diagnosis. Um, and a very, very humbling and really puts you on your toes because the underlying answer was that this person is gushing out of the aorta in a contained manner into their skin. That was what's going on. And yet he presented 10 days later. So very, very humbling in so many directions. Um, and of course, in terms of the pandemic. Um, but I will remember this case forever. I think you taught us so much and presented it in such an engaging way, such that uh, the bulge was held close to your chest, literally, and pun sort of intended. Uh, and it's amazing how the physical exam here took you 99% of the way to the answer with you see a bulge and you put your hand on it and it's moving and you know, this patient has an aortic disease and boom, there's your 99% of the way there. Really, really humbling and educational case. And um, Mariana, I just wanted to thank you. You did a really good job of presenting the case and congratulations on your publication. I think making your uh, clinical work scholarly is very academic of you and I uh, appreciate your time, Mariana. I'm gonna pass the mic to uh, Noah to take home the teaching points. Hey everyone. So what an amazing case and an amazing discussion. Uh, we first started with a uh, you know, middle-aged man with progressive subacute chest pain. Uh, chest pain, it must we must have certain diagnostic tests at our disposal to evaluate the causes. So we have to have a chest X-ray, troponins, and an EKG. Uh, we could go further and invest more cognitive effort in uh, giving in creating a differential diagnosis list, but that would not be wise at this moment without those informations. Um, we also talked about how this subacute presentation reassured us a little bit of severe causes, but it does not rule out those diagnoses. Uh, another characteristic of this patient's presentation is that it was worsened by exertion. So exertion, uh, worsening by exertion, helped us narrow the differential diagnosis to the cardiopulmonary system or the blood, given that other causes of chest pain usually are not affected by it. Uh, we then briefly talked about how the late presentation of this patient could mean either a slow tempo of the disease versus barriers to care. In this case, this patient had a chronic diagnosis, he had chronic chest pain, but the changing characteristic being intermittent and then becoming constant made him look uh, for care. We also got the information that he had a previous aortic pathology, and this was really helpful because it extended the differential diagnosis to complications of this uh, previous surgery and to hidden syndromes, syndromes that could have caused the problem in the first 
place, especially given his young age at the first aortic dissection that he had. We had a really nice framework for aortic pathologies. Uh, so three possible buckets, inflammation, genetics, and idiopathic, being idiopathic age and hypertension related. We also talked about how this previous medical history cannot be ignored. Those patients, we need to, uh, to have imaging to make sure that his aorta is okay, even if all the rest is reassuring. Speaking of reassuring, when we did the physical exam, the first thing we see are the vital signs. The normal vital signs can be, can trip us up, you know, uh, we can be kind of facially reassured by this presentation, but it's important to remember that mediastinal disease processes affect the vital signs late in the presentation. So we should be aware of those patients. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Then we had the biggest pivot point in the discussion so far. We had a pulsatile bulge in the anterior chest. So here, chest pain fell to the wayside, you know, fell to the background. We had a pulsatile bulge and that became our number one priority. So this is a vascular issue until proven otherwise. And we have basically two ways of thinking about this. Complications of previous surgery or a progression of underlying disease. Given the young age at the earlier presentation, we were betting more on an underlying disease process. And now it's warranted to invest more cognitive effort into creating a potential list of differential diagnosis for those aortic pathologies. Uh, we also briefly talked about how aortic pathologies, when we say that, we usually think about intrinsic complications, but they can also present as extrinsic complications, be it a compression or fistulization in this case. And then we had a diagnostic uncertainty because we figured out the problem. He had an aortic cutaneous fistula, but then we should ask ourselves and try to find out, is this only bad luck, which is a possible uh, hypothesis, or is this something else? And here, diagnostic checklist. So pulling up up to date and seeing all the possible causes of aortic pathologies and trying to invest some uh, cognitive effort into finding out if this patient had an underlying syndrome or not. Unfortunately, this question will, be, will go unanswered for this case, but this is something we should keep in mind for future cases. And that's all I have for today. Noah, um, do you want to go on tour with Robbie and me? <laughs> I, I felt like you captured at least my teaching better than I taught it myself. Uh, this reminds me of like a chief resident teaching clinical reasoning and medical knowledge. It's, I was just listening. It's like poetry. Very, very nice job. We, we pay for only economy class air, airfare. <laughs> 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 oh, Prof. Raz. No, that was amazing. Thank you all. I really, really appreciate you. Thank you, Mariana, for uh, an incredible case. Prof. Rez, uh, as always, such a pleasure. Um, we're on a little bit of a break. To, well, not on a break. We're doing an Academy VMR. Uh, for those of you who might not know, um, the CP Solvers team members are absolutely incredible, just like Noah, um, who did Teaching Voids, Aisha, who was scribing, and Mariana, who presented, and many, many others who are here. Um, we all hang out once a week and um, practice some reasoning. So I'm uh, really excited to do that tomorrow, but we'll be back on, on Sunday with a student VMR. So hope to see you all then. And thank you. Bye.